21-year-old Reagan Tokes was a reliable and smart young woman who attended Ohio State University. Full of ambition, with her whole life ahead of her, the sky was the limit. On a very chilly morning in February 2017, Reagan's roommate went into Reagan's bedroom so they could walk to class together as they had planned. But Reagan's room was completely empty, and Reagan was nowhere to be found. The details that slowly started to surface over the next 24 hours absolutely haunted the community, and it turned those closest to Reagan's entire world upside down. Hey guys, I'm Annie Elise with Tend to Life. Go ahead and smash that like button, smash that subscribe button, and let's get into it. Tend to Life with Annie Elise starts right now. Okay, Tend to Lifers, I have a question for you. Do you like solving mysteries? Do you enjoy finding the red flags and murders, researching, sifting through all the evidence to get to the root of a crime? No need to answer. I already know you do. Well, I discovered the perfect thing for you, and it is called Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is a new way of gameplay, all while using your expert sleuthing skills, which I know every single one of you is great at. Each box is a complete murder mystery that you have to solve. You're the detective. You get all of the evidence, and it's your job to figure out who the killer is. The stories are deeply immersive and feel extremely real, with all kinds of evidence and clues. And the items in the box are realistic. They feel authentic, and they're pretty cool that you're actually going to want to keep them when you're done playing the game. You get dossiers, maps, evidence, supporting whereabouts and motivations, all to create a timeline of your own and map out the crime. And just like real crimes, the more evidence you can consume, the narrower your suspect list is. Just like real detective work, you must establish means, motives, and opportunities for each suspect. Then a solution note will confirm or deny your claim. I just received Dead on the Vine, and I cannot wait to play it with my family on Christmas Eve while we drink some wine too to, you know, of course, stay in theme. And the premise of Dead on the Vine is about the Lewin Estate Vineyard, which touts strong family bonds, but the clan matriarch, Gail, is then found dead. And the death was ruled an accident until the autopsy returned, and it was discovered that Gail was poisoned. And the only ones who could have killed her are members of her own family. So who did it? We need to find out, or I need to find out. Games are for sale online directly from Hunt a Killer as well as Walmart and Target. And you know I am hooking you up. Head to huntakiller.com slash 10 to life and use code 10 to life to take advantage of the killer discounts and limited edition merchandise during their month of mystery. You guys are going to love this so much. So make sure that you guys check it out. Also, it makes such a great gift for all of your sleuthy family and friends. And we know that the holidays are right around the corner. So check it out now. And don't forget to use my code 10 to life for those extra special discounts. Reagan Tokes was a 21-year-old student at The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. She had beautiful, long, dark brown hair a little past her shoulders and striking brown eyes. She was born in 1995 to her parents Toby and Lisa, and they had such a close relationship with their oldest daughter, and they described her as being the glue that held them all together. Reagan was also a very ambitious girl. When her parents and her younger sister Mackenzie moved to Florida after her graduation, she stayed in Ohio to attend Ohio State University. Ohio State was her absolute dream school. She was studying psychology and was set to graduate in May of 2017. Her goals and dreams were to move to Cleveland and work at the Cleveland Clinic after graduating. She also worked while she was in school at a restaurant and bar downtown called Bodega. She was a hard worker that knew her goals in life and what it would take to achieve them. Reagan also was an extremely reliable person. When she made plans, she stuck to them. When she told you that she was going to do something, she meant it. And because of that, what happened on the morning of February 9th took everybody by surprise. On the morning of February 9th, 2017, Reagan's roommate Kristen walked into Reagan's room to find it completely empty. That had shocked her, since Reagan had told her that they would walk to class together that morning. Since it was midterms week, she thought that maybe Reagan had forgotten and that with everything on her mind, that maybe she went to the library or something. Strange, but explainable. By mid-afternoon, her friends still hadn't seen or heard from her, though, so they knew that something had to be wrong. The night before, Reagan had texted her father while she was at work, letting him know that she would call him after she left work that night. But she never called, 
and her parents began to worry. She wasn't the type of person to not call. She was in contact with her parents every day religiously. So they tried calling and texting her multiple times with no answer. At around 2 a.m., Reagan's phone went dead. So when they learned from her friends the next morning that they hadn't seen her either and that she had missed her classes, they immediately filed a missing persons report. Her friends began retracing her steps, trying to figure out where she had been last and with who. They went back to Bodega, Reagan's work, and once Reagan's manager found out that her friends hadn't heard from her and couldn't find her, he filed a missing persons report too. Columbus Police, Tech 62. Hi. Uh, so we had a uh, employee leave work last night, and she has not been home. Uh, her phone is off. Nobody can find her. So I wanted to see what I could do about filing a report or getting any kind of documentation down. Okay. You you want to? So she left work, and you haven't heard from her, and like she didn't report today. Uh, correct. Um, her mom has been calling, uh, looking for. Um, we can't find her car around work. I called uh, the jail, and they said she wasn't in the Franklin County Jail. So, okay, we um, can um, just trying to see what my next step we is. We can do here. A, If you have her address, we can send the police to her house to do a well check on her. Well, actually, her roommates are here. She hasn't been home at all either. Mm. Everyone knew Reagan wasn't the type to just ignore her friends and family or miss work, even her manager. Her parents started to worry that maybe she had been in a car wreck, but after checking local hospitals, that thought was quickly squashed. So what happened, and where was Reagan? As Reagan's family and friends were frantically searching for her, a jogger was on their usual morning run at Sakoto Grove Metro Park when they saw what would change everybody's lives forever. A body. Brian Davidson was on his morning jog, and when he stumbled across this, he says that he could tell it was definitely a woman. He immediately called the police. This woman was completely naked and had been shot in the head. When the body was first found, due to the way this woman was killed, she was hard to immediately identify. The body was at first classified as Jane Doe. Then, police believed it could have been a runaway from the next town over. Police knew it was a woman in her 20s and that she had a circle tattoo. And as soon as a missing persons report was filed and they learned that Reagan had a similar tattoo, cops had a sinking suspicion that the body that they found could belong to Reagan Tokes. However, they needed a positive identification from a family member. And keep in mind, Reagan's parents lived all the way in Florida at this time, so they had her uncle go and identify her. And that's when they confirmed the identification of Reagan. But what happened to Reagan? How did leaving work like she did any other night go so wrong? Who could do this horrific crime to such a sweet and truly innocent person who had her whole life ahead of her like Reagan did? The night before this grisly discovery, Reagan had gone to work at Bodega as planned. She had a fairly slow night and ended up leaving work around 9.45 p.m. This was just like any other night for Reagan, or so she believed. Reagan left work and walked to her car that was parked just around the corner. While she was on her way to her car, though, she was held at gunpoint and abducted. She was forced to drive to two separate ATMs to withdraw money. The first stop was at a Chase Bank at around 10.02 p.m. However, this transaction declined. So the next stop was 12 minutes later at 10.14 p.m. at Huntington Bank. Reagan tried to withdraw $500, but being a typical college student without a lot of income, this transaction also declined. Four minutes later at 10.18 p.m., Reagan and her abductor arrived in an alleyway where they stayed for 12 minutes and where Reagan was unfortunately. After this, Reagan drove back to the first ATM that she had stopped at and withdrew $60, then proceeded to go to two separate gas stations, a Sunoco station at 11.12 p.m. and a Turkey Hill station at 11.41 p.m. Investigators were later able to view the ATM footage that showed her at these ATMs with what looked to be a shadowy figure in the passenger seat. Reagan had done everything she was told by this person, but it wasn't good enough. Her abductor made her drive to Scioto Grove Metro Park, park the vehicle, take off all of her clothes and shoes, and march into a field in the park. That is when she was shot execution style, once through the back of her head and once through the left side of her face. Investigators immediately started looking into people that could have harmed her, 
According to her friends and family, she was the type of person to make friends, not enemies, and everybody loved her. Investigators first started at the place that she was last seen, Bodega. They got access to the security cameras in the restaurant where you can actually see her leaving after her shift. Nobody is seen getting up after her or following her out of the building. So then they started looking into her recent ex-boyfriend named Jake Washsick. Jake and Reagan had very recently broken up. He claimed that it was a mutual agreement and that they both felt that they didn't have enough time for school and a relationship. Reagan's friends were also friends with Jake and claimed he truly seemed to love and care for her no matter what. So they did not believe that there was any way that he could have hurt her. Investigators interviewed Jake after the body was found, and at one point in the interview, investigators asked why Jake would describe Reagan as being in a better place in an Instagram post he made of the two of them after he learned the news. And this has been a bit controversial. Investigators said that they thought that this was a red flag. Jake, however, just said that he meant he believed she was now in heaven. Investigators argued that it was an odd thing to say for someone who lived a good life. However, I think that seems a bit of a stretch and is something very regularly seen when somebody passes. They checked his alibi and it was rock solid. Even though the police thought that some of the things he said were a little bit odd, he wasn't considered a suspect. Reagan's car had also been missing, so investigators started the search for it and eventually, using a commercial vehicle's digital reader, they captured the front license plate of her car and it looked like it had been abandoned in southeast Columbus near the Children's Hospital. It looked as if somebody had attempted to set the car on fire, but was unsuccessful. There were small burn marks in the back seat of the car from those attempts. In the back of the car were cigarette butts with DNA all over them. Also inside of the car was a gas can. Police sent the DNA off for testing and they got a hit. It came back belonging to a man named Brian Goldsby. Police also found that a similar gas can to the one found in the car had also been purchased the night of the murder, and they obtained a photo of Brian buying it. But who was this person, and what was his connection to Reagan? Brian Goldsby was a Columbus native, born and raised. Born in 1988, he grew up in a rough household with a pretty abusive mother who he said was heavily addicted to drugs and alcohol. Like many people in lower-income households with parents who aren't present, it didn't take long for him to begin running the streets and getting into trouble in his youth. So Brian was arrested on February 11th at 4 a.m. by SWAT officers and then taken to the precinct to be interrogated. We know both both free- Okay, you want to know how? Mm -hmm. DNA from the car. My DNA? Yep. Down the chicken. Okay. You have a cigarette butt in there. Oh. I'm being honest with you. And, 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 and that's what you were just telling me about the. Uh, do you want to get everything? And, and this tip. But you would, without the, DNA, without yeah, the we, cigarette, y'all wouldn't have had that. Yeah. You know? Well, we, no, we had this before. We had this before. We had the cigarette. Okay. That's what I'm saying. What, before, see, that's what I'm. Before that, how did you know to look for me for a robbery? We had the photographs of that speedway, right? And then the DNA. That's speedway. Before, I'm you buying the gas, the gas can? can? The gas can. Oh, so y'all found the car. I found the gas can in the car. Mm -hmm. And y'all found out where it came from. Yeah. Brian seems particularly interested in the process the detectives used to find him. Brian at first confessed to making Reagan drive to ATMs to make those withdrawals, as well as forcing her to drive to the park. At first, he denied having any sexual contact with her, as well as having a gun or shooting her. I didn't shoot nobody. You did. Brian, you did, you did, you did, and you know it, man. Brian puts his head in his hands here, indicating that he may be losing his resolve. The detective on Reagan's case decided it was time for a new approach and decided on a new strategy to make Brian confess. They suggested to Brian that he must have had an accomplice. And taking their bait, he claimed that a man named TJ demanded money from him and told him that he would harm his children if he didn't give it to him. Who was in the f***ing car with you? I'm not doing nothing. I want to know. Who pulled the f***ing trigger, Brian? If I didn't bring me money back. Mm -hmm. Right. 
you. You and your family. You made it. All right. God bless you. I don't have no time. I got a f***ing life in shambles. I know you. I don't need this, man. I know you. I don't need this, man. All I wanted to do was take care of my kids and make sure that they were cool and provide for them. That's why I was working. I ain't never had a f***ing job this long. Now I'm f***ing lost out on my goddamn job. So did he, did he tell you to go out and get a girl? Huh? Did he, whose idea was to go get the girl? He said that TJ forced him to rape Reagan at gunpoint. He even went as far as saying, I wanted to just run and call the cops for real. I could have, but at the same time, I didn't want to put my babies in jeopardy. He then continued by saying at the park, TJ forced Reagan to undress and proceeded to shoot her twice in the head. He claimed that he was in the car and saw her death happen. He even told police that some of Reagan's last words were, I just want to live. The police knew that he was lying about this TJ guy, but they went along with it and pretended to believe him. They did extensive research to verify that this TJ person did not exist, and Brian later gave them information that actually led them to the murder weapon. While Brian was in jail, he confessed to a friend and to the mother of his child that he was the one who killed Reagan, and that after killing Reagan, he took her silver Acura TL to his girlfriend's home. The two went to McDonald's together at 1.45 a.m., and Brian gave her Reagan's black Kate Spade purse and white wallet as a gift. He later disposed of the gun and shell casings in a sewer, then abandoned the car after trying to burn it. Brian had just recently been released from prison, where he had served six years for kidnapping a pregnant woman and her child and raping the woman. He had pled to robbery and attempted rape. He was staying in a temporary housing program where the officials at the housing program and his parole officer did not monitor him. He violated his probation and committed six robberies without being arrested before he ended up murdering Reagan. Brian later admitted that he had been walking around the short north area of Columbus specifically looking for potential victims. That was when he saw Reagan alone, walking to her car at night. So she truly just was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now, an interesting thing about Brian, he was wearing an ankle monitor, and the locations placed him in the exact locations that Reagan had been in. Many people think that when people are wearing a GPS monitor, an alarm will go off if a person isn't where they are supposed to be, and then police will come get them and arrest them, but that's not how it works. The majority of GPS monitors just track the locations after the fact and then report it to the parole officers, not even to the police. Most of the time, ankle monitors are a third party that just sends the location to the parole officers. It's not at all live tracking like people think it is. Not only was Brian wearing an ankle monitor while killing Reagan, but he was wearing an ankle monitor while attacking multiple other women in the Columbus area and was seen on COTA bus film many times in the weeks leading up to Reagan's murder. He was not being monitored or held on a curfew in the slightest. It's just unbelievable because had he been actually being monitored, maybe this would never have happened because he would have been caught for the other several crimes that he was committing. Jury selection for the trial began around one year later on February 23rd, 2018. Brian's defense attorneys requested a change of venue due to the extensive media coverage on the case, but the judge denied it. The trial began on March 5th, 2018. Franklin County DA Ron O'Brien told the jurors in his opening statement that Reagan experienced a night of terror and that she was a psychology major that never made it to graduation because she was executed at point blank range by a handgun. On the second day of the trial, jurors were given a definitive timeline of where Reagan went the night of her murder. They viewed crime scene photos and heard from the witness that had discovered her body at the park. They also heard from Reagan's three roommates who testified about the night she went missing and identified the stolen Kate Spade purse that Brian had taken after murdering her and given to his girlfriend. On March 7th, jurors heard from the ex-girlfriend of Brian, whom he had given that purse to, as well as an Ohio Bureau of Investigation agent on March 8th, prosecutors showed a video of Brian's interrogation by Detective Forney, who took the stand as a witness. On the final day of trial, forensic scientists testified that Brian's DNA was found inside Reagan's body and that her DNA was inside of the gun's barrel. The mother of Brian's child and his fellow inmate, whom he had told that he had killed Reagan, also both testified. He was there, said hello, and he told me that 
just to watch out for his coat because he had a gun in his coat and he didn't want my son to touch the coat. In closing arguments, prosecutors argued that Brian killed Reagan so that he would not be caught. His defense argued that he wasn't smart enough to plan a murder and killed her as a result of him panicking. Verdict, we the jury in this case being duly impaneled and sworn, find the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt as to count one in the indictment for aggravated murder. Specification one, jury finds him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt with the specification of aggravated robbery. Specification two, guilty beyond a reasonable doubt for the specification of kidnapping. Specification three, guilty beyond a reasonable doubt for the specification of Specification four, guilty beyond a reasonable doubt for uh, attempting to escape detention apprehension. Specification five, guilty beyond a reasonable doubt on the firearm specification, guilty that he brandished or displayed it. Count two, we the jury find the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of kidnapping. They further find beyond a reasonable doubt he did brandish, display, or utilize a firearm in the commission of the offense. Count three, aggravated murder, guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Guilty beyond a reasonable doubt as to specification for kidnapping. Guilty beyond a reasonable doubt for the specification of um, all attempting committing a Guilty beyond a reasonable doubt for the specification of um, escaping detection apprehension. Specification five, guilty beyond a reasonable doubt that he did have a firearm, did brandish and or display it. Count four, aggravated robbery. Guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Guilty of the firearm specification that he did brandish display. Use it. Verdict for count five, aggravated murder. Guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Specification one, I'm sorry. Guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, count five. Specification one, guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of the specification of committing uh, the murder, aggravated murder during an aggravated robbery. Specification two, guilty of aggravated murder, guilty of the specification of committing the offense while attempting or committing kidnapping. Specification three, guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of the aggravated murder while fleeing or committing immediately after the rape offense. Specification four, guilty of aggravated murder. State has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that he committed the offense to escape uh, detention, apprehension, or trial for the, the uh, offenses that we've gone through. On March 13th, 2018, Brian Goldsby was convicted on all counts. And amazingly, March 13th also would have been Reagan's 23rd birthday, which seems like just such an amazing sign and justice for Reagan. Although he was convicted, the jury couldn't decide and agree on the penalty. Four voted for life in prison, while eight voted for the death penalty. The judge ended up sentencing Brian to life in prison. During the sentencing, the judge told Brian, Reagan did nothing wrong whatsoever, and yet she forfeited her life because of your background. You get spared because of your background, and yet she forfeited her life. After he was sentenced to prison, he pled guilty to all six robberies that he had committed before the murder. He is currently incarcerated at the Ohio State Penitentiary. In 2018, not long after his conviction, Brian's lawyers requested an appeal, but then decided to drop it. DA Ron O'Brien continued to seek the death penalty for Brian. In 2018, Ron filed a 53-page motion with over 100 pages of exhibits and requested a cross-appeal. Ron, as well as other prosecutors, argued that a legal error allowed for him to escape the death penalty. They claimed that during the penalty phase of the trial, the judge didn't correctly instruct them by telling them that the defense had no burden of proof when introducing mitigating factors. According to the prosecutors, this meant that the jurors considered mitigating factors presented by the defense that never actually happened. They used the example of when prosecutors disputed Brian's claims that he had experienced rape as a child because he changed his story multiple times. He had said it was when he was 10 years old, then 12 years old, then 13 years old. Prosecutors also said that he gave inconsistent information about the location of the rape, 
by stating three completely different locations. Ron wrote in the request that there were ample reasons to pursue the death penalty and stated that Brian was a remorseless, violent offender prone to and robbery and now aggravated murder. Ron further stated, given the many crimes committed by the defendant, the life without parole sentence for the aggravated murder can be viewed as a failed of justice that warrants correction upon now showing legal error. By January 2019, nothing had been done though. So Ron asked the appeals court to expedite the appeal. A couple of months later in April, Ohio's 10th District Court of Appeals granted the state's authority to appeal. In July of 2020, oral arguments were made in front of the Court of Appeals. Then, on September 29th, the appeals court ruled that the judge's instructions had actually been proper. Prosecutors again appealed this decision, and the Supreme Court announced in January 2021 that it had accepted the case. However, under the newly appointed DA, the state's appeal was withdrawn, and the Ohio Supreme Court dismissed the case. Reagan's family was absolutely infuriated with the system and truly believed it had failed her and their family for multiple reasons. So in May of 2018, her family filed a lawsuit against the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction, which is the parent company of the exit program that housed Brian. The lawsuit argued that they were negligent and failed to monitor Brian as he should have actually been monitored. Unfortunately, the lawsuit was dismissed by a judge in September of that year, stating that the center had no duty to prevent Brian from harming Reagan because apparently he had no special relationship with her. Reagan's family appealed this decision, but it was again dismissed by the Court of Appeals. Her family then appealed to the Supreme Court of Ohio. The lawsuit stated that the Rehabilitation Center was indeed aware that Brian posed a threat to others, and they ignored it. It also said that a special relationship existed between the Rehabilitation Center and Brian because of their knowledge that he represented a substantial risk of harm to others, and that the center had the ability to control him. Which, to be fair, the detention center was literally attached to his ankle by an ankle monitor. Is the whole purpose not to monitor their activity? Ohio Supreme Court announced that they couldn't hear Reagan's family's case against the detention center, and the justices voted 6-1 to one not to accept it. This did not discourage Reagan's family, though. They were determined to work with lawmakers to address the systematic failures that led to their daughter's murder, which I think is extremely admirable. In 2018, the reagan tokes Act was introduced in the Ohio House and Senate. In December 2018, part of the reagan tokes Act was signed into law by the governor. She would want us doing this at this point. She would want us trying to make something positive from this terrible tragedy. She just had such a kind, loving spirit. This portion of the law requires judges to sentence offenders responsible for class one and class two felonies, which are the most serious felonies in the state of Ohio, to a range of years in prison consisting of a minimum term and a maximum term. If the offender is being sentenced for a single offense, the maximum term is the minimum term plus 50%. If the offender is given several terms to be served concurrently or consecutively, the maximum sentence adds 50% to the longest minimum terms for the most serious felony, for the most serious felony for which they are being sentenced. Under the reagan tokes Act, offenders are presumed to be released at the end of the minimum term. To extend the term, the detention center has to hold an administrative hearing and find that the inmate has engaged in improper conduct and is a continued threat to society which Brian had 52 infractions while in prison and was still released. He did not show his sentence made him at all reformed or a better person. This history should matter, and it should come with additional consequences, not rights and freedoms with no boundaries. This act also allows the detention center to reduce an inmate sentence by 5 to 15 percent for exceptional conduct, unless they are on the registry and this act went into effect March 21st, 2019. The next part of this act was reintroduced in 2019. This section addressed how criminals are monitored as well as reducing the caseloads of parole officers and would require that the state creates a re-entry program for all offenders released from prison if they intend to reside in a home such as a halfway house. It also addresses GPS monitoring of felons under post-released control. Reagan's family is forever missing a piece without her. They have said that to them, Brian does not exist. 
They have been focused on justice for Reagan and keeping that alive, and they think nothing of the man who so brutally ended their daughter's life. He doesn't exist to us, I can tell you. He doesn't exist. He hasn't existed in our world since the day we heard his name. This was about justice for Reagan, and I believe that that happened. But we give him no thought, no energy. He's gone forever. They have done everything they possibly can to not only keep her memory alive, but to make sure nobody else has to grieve for their loved one like they had to do. The park her body was in has now been turned into a tranquility garden in her memory. Her parents have started a scholarship for Ohio State students to help give others the opportunity and experience that she was so grateful for. They walked on stage to receive Reagan's diploma at her graduation, and that was just months after her death. And Reagan Delaney Tokes to receive the degree Bachelor of Arts. The Tokes family, while battling their emotions, received Reagan's posthumous degree on her behalf. And her parents also set up a class that teaches self-defense to young women. They never stopped fighting for Reagan and her memory, and they never will. Guys, this case is just so awful because it is such a clear illustration of how the system has failed. How was this person who was released from prison and on GPS monitoring able to get away with six robberies, attacking several different women, and just all of these things without ever being tracked or held accountable? Had they actually had a system in place, he could have been caught at any one of those robberies so that 21-year-old Reagan would still be alive. And that is being generous, saying that he should have been released in the first place. The fact that he had 52 infractions while incarcerated and yet still was released is just beyond me. And then released and not even having this like hyper-focused tracking, it is unreal. It is such a senseless tragedy and just so horrible that this family has now lost their beautiful, lively young daughter at the hands of this monster who literally said he was out searching for victims. What if it wasn't slow that night at Reagan's restaurant? What if it wasn't slow that night at Reagan's work? What if she hadn't left early? She may never have even crossed paths with this monster. What would have happened had he been caught with one of the robberies? She would have made it home safely that night. She would have called her dad like she promised. She would have walked class the next morning with her friend Kristen. How did this situation become so tragic based on the broken pieces in the system. It's horrific and just so incredibly sad. As I mentioned, Reagan's family is not stopping fighting for her. They want justice. They want to make this case widely known. Please leave your supportive comments for the family in the section below. And also let me know what you guys think about this. How does this happen? And how do we fix this? How do we allow these felons to just go back out and target all of these other people and never be held accountable. It is crazy. And even scarier, how much longer could he have gotten away with crimes had Reagan's body not been discovered when it was? That is a very unnerving thing to think about. All right, guys, thanks again for tuning in. Please don't forget to like this video on your way out. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't done so already. And until the next one, stay safe.